Welcome to Discovering. Our birch bark canoe is getting closer to its destiny with water. Get it up in there, make sure there's not a root in the way. And Kristen was in Ironwood for a look at the Sisu Ski Fest. Stick around, that's all tonight, right here on Discovery. The secret streams that flow beneath the cliffs of colored stone. Forest thick and healthy with birch and pine and oak. Surrounded by the greatest lakes this world has ever known. The black bear's awesome presence as he roams the hills and fields. Call of the timber wolf, the loon's lonesome trill, the eagle soaring high above, the trout lies deep and still. These are what I treasure, the only way I measure feelings that I have for this fine land. There is so much to discover when you're a long time lover of northern Michigan. Last week on our birch bark canoe project, we watched the ribs being formed. After spending some time behind the wood stove, they're ready to go in. Well, here's half the ribs. Make two bundles like this. They've been sitting like this and behind the wood stove for the last couple of weeks drying out. So they'll hold their shape. They're not rubbery or nothing no more. So you can see how the canoe is just going to slowly go up to being very narrow. All the way to the end of the boat where it's pretty sharp actually. And uh, you alternate them. You make two bundles like this and you kind of alternate them back and forth so then that way you see little flat spots or imperfections and you keep switching them back and forth and the, the bark is the true serum. It forces everybody into place when you pound them in because this all held together by tension. Number 19. Mark off the top of the gunnel. I cut these down. I give them a nice little curve because the planking usually stops right about at that point. And then we make our 45 degree chisel on top to fit up in the groove under the gunnel. At the end of your ribs, it's kind of like the, all of these woodworking bits on the canoe. It's part of the signature. And you look in uh, photos of old boats or other people's boats and everybody's got their own little way of doing it. So that's why you can look at a boat in a museum. You could just about figure out the guy who put that together. Get it up in there, make sure there's not a root in the way. And we always make them a little extra big. And then uh, we're always making sure that you got to keep your debris out of here because if debris gets in between these, lam these layers that you're laminating together, then you have a bump on the outside of your boat. I one time had a bump sticking out of the bottom of a boat and I had to take the whole boat apart and found a chunk of wood sitting down in the bottommost layer. Make sure everything seats nice. Let's get some hot water and make everybody stretch. Keep the roots moist so they don't blow out. They're very tough when they're wet. And then some water down the bark there. Yeah, that's kind of sticking out right there. Let's take off maybe eighth of an inch off each side. Now she goes. See, oh, that's a little better. There's bound to be some humps on the side. The ribs are all leaning on one edge. When they go home, then the pressure will be on the flat of the rib and it all evens out. But you still gotta pay attention.
there's a cedar splits. Take it down to an eighth or less and uh, thin out the edges and the ends like that. So when, because you overlap them, the grain of the bark goes from side to side in the boat and then you've got this going from end to end. So you have fibers going both ways. That's what gives the canoe its body strength. And the gunnels give it like its bone strength, but this is sort of the, the skin of it. These are all split out of primo cedar. Got to be straight, splits out nice like that. It's hard to find this stuff. And then they have to overlap a little bit. That's why you chamfer the edge, bring it to a pretty sharp edge. See how that's wider? It's too big of a change. Once we get out into the middle of the boat here and we get all the big ribs in, then those install fast. It's not quite so fussy. But to get your ends right, that's fussy. That's why I spend a lot of time maybe spend half a day just fitting those in like that. Here's a little Stone Age trick you can do to keep your bark leak proof for a long time. You see on, uh, on, the, on the bark inside after we clean it up and that is a layer of pitch. It's all shiny in there now. Mixed with some bear fat so it's, it's, it's sticky and when it's warm out it'll be it'll flow and then you Save up all your bits of delaminated bark like this, look like newspaper. You can lay that on there so it doesn't just get everything all covered with stick. If you have a compromise in the bark, this will seal it all up from the inside. And uh, a really cool thing is if you do punch a hole in your boat and it's maybe a split or something, you can roll it over in the sunshine and it'll usually heal itself once it warms up and then uh, the sticky pitch will flow into that spot. You can have a bark boat that don't leak for years and years, maybe 10 or more years. And this doesn't add too much weight. Everything adds weight. If you want the ultimate lightweight boat, then it's going to be fragile and it might leak a little bit. But it'll be easy to carry. This is a five thwart boat, obviously. If you lived in uh, rice country, you wouldn't have the middle thwart, you'd probably have uh, thwarts on either side because that would be where you fold the rice down into while you tap it with your, your sticks. They lock the boat, they're pegged in and then lashed in to this inwell. And you carve them a little bit because you're going to be leaning back. This is, the, this is what your back's going to lean on if you're sitting in this end. And they all got a little curve just so it's a little easier on your back. And it's nice to, to carve them like they're wide and thin and then they get a little thicker and narrower. But then that way the flex of them, is, the stress will be evenly distributed over the whole piece as opposed to having a weak spot. I like them to flex like a bow, just in case someone with a big butt wants to sit on top of there. You want it to be able to take the load. So if, if you want a portage, I just, I flip it up. This is a nice big strong one. I rest that on my shoulder, shoulders and, and walk off with the boat. But if you had to carry it very far, that wouldn't be very stable so you can take a couple of paddles tie them on to the tops of these have the blades out here sort of big enough to rest on each shoulder and then you can grab that pick it up on your head and hold on to the paddle handles and you could carry the boat for miles like that maybe throw a shirt or something to pad your shoulder blades <laughs> Taking off a little bit, maybe another eighth of an inch off each end. You gotta have them balanced. Keep the balance so the boat stays symmetric. So you get that 
wedge end up in the little groove that you got carved in there. So it feels a little tight. Better off start out tight. You can always make them smaller. And this is worth being fussy about because this makes or breaks the shape of the boat. A lot of time getting this right. Whatever it takes. If you don't do this right, it doesn't matter what else you did right. It will all come out wrong. Yeah. So you take each rib in close to where it's going to be its final resting place. But you don't take it all the way. Usually let it sit for a day or two. Let things stretch out. Get used to each other. And then what we'll do is we'll flip the boat over and we'll pour hot water over the whole thing. You can hear the bark stretch and then you pound them all home, keep pouring more water on there, do it from underneath. You can hear the bark just groaning and the stitching, everything's pulling tight. Hopefully nothing explodes. Alrighty, so this on top here, you see, is uh, the gunnel cap. It's just a thin piece. It's basically to protect the lashing from when you flip the boat over, or drag it around, dragging nets or gear or whatever over the edge of the boat. Because the lashings, when they're dry, are fragile. When they're wet, they're pretty tough. And then these are held down with little wooden pegs here. You split out a little piece of hardwood. And I whittle them into little pegs. And you make them with a square top because you're pounding them into the green. If you pound it in this way across the grain, you'll just pop the wood apart. So you put it in the wood this way and it presses on the grain in a lengthwise fashion. And it'll never split your wood, it'll just bend it into position. Because you need a head on it or the cap will just pop right off. And sharpen the end, you drill a little hole down in there, maybe halfway through the gunnel and you can, it'll pound the rest of the way in. This saw has no set to the teeth so it's made for flush cuts it's like they made it for canoe builders and they put that little sliver of bark in there so it holds the blade just a little bit high so that these stick up just a little bit and then later on I'll go over and I'll peen that over make it even hold on even tighter than it does. We've also trimmed a re reinforcing strip here down to a couple inches below the gunnel. You always make that extra big and we have to be able to expose this seam here so we can pitch this in here. This needs to be waterproof up to this point. So I cut it down just kind of designed it so that this would stay just above that because the bark wasn't wide enough so we had to add that side panel in there. So she is stitching the gunnel cap on the ends where you can't peg it, it's too small. So you'd have lashings in the three places on each end to hold it down. And of course there's always lots of little whittling so you carve a little notch in here so when she wraps this, the root around there it doesn't just slide off the top. Same thing we did on the gunnel itself. So there's a little, little stop on there. And there's a little, we call that the little bark deck in there. So you have to enclose this part so you don't get debris go inside the space down inside there. Water can get in and out, but you don't want uh, mice to do the same. I ain't got none, Bob. <laughs> Ufta, don't forget Ufta. Ufta! On the very western edge of the UP, in Ironwood, is where I found a whole lot of skis, snow and sisu. You know, that Finnish word that has no English translation. Closest one probably being grit. 
which is needed today because it's cold and it's time for the very first cross country ski race in the Midwest. Posted in 2011th annual Sisu Ski Race. This race has grown over the years. We started out uh, as a, I think a rinky dink, you know, organ thing, but I'll tell you, we are fine tuned <laughs> and we have more run one of the finest races anywhere. <laughs> We have approximately 750 racers this year, and uh, you know, it just continues to grow, and we got great snow, and uh, that's what makes the Sisu. And again, you know, we always get nice weather like this. You know, oh, yeah. this balmy 12 degrees that we have here. I mean, racers appreciate the, <laughs> the warm, the warmness of the people and the weather. <laughs> go for a 1720, go! It started right with a group of people who had a vision of a ski race that would start here at ABR Trails and make its way to downtown Ironwood. And each year it's changed a little bit. And the last few years it's been growing. I think we have a winning formula now that attracts a lot of people from all over the country. They're basically using this as a kind of like a warm-up to the to the Berkebiner. So, I mean, people come from you know, all over, even out in Vermont and areas like that, just to, you know, get to ski under the conditions that they're going to find at the Berkey. We have a 30K race and a 15K race. We have both the classic and the skate techniques. And I think those distances are what people are ready for this early in the season. So. Uh, we also have a really great course. We're known for really great snow and great grooming and wonderful volunteers and small town hospitality. And so all of that put together makes for a really great race experience. There we go, what else do we get then? 200 plus volunteers help make the SISU happen. Without the mother and daughter combo here, <laughs> this race could never go by because they're the ones that make sure that everybody's in their their proper That's wave right. number <laughs> everybody gets their proper time now wave three you're up at the red yep, line you're ready to go you're, you're up at the red line getting ready to go seconds. soft here just be careful and once all the racers are lined up let the racing season begin five four three two one good luck The racers left the start line in waves and skied through the ABR trails along the Montreal River and north to the finish line in downtown Ironwood. The fastest skiers beat me to the finish line, but I still managed to run into the 30K freestyle female top finisher. The race course was really, really awesome. It was groomed really well, and the terrain's good. It's a lot of like different terrain. There's uphills, downhills, and a lot of twisty, turny stuff, and then there's a good, uh, really long like flat section, so you kind of get a little bit of everything. So last year I raced here, and I was second Victoria. by like, I think 0.1 seconds or something. We had a sprint finish. So I, I really wanted to come back for revenge. And uh, I did, I was able to win today. Um, so that was pretty cool. That was so good. Not our first time up at ABR, but it's our first time yeah. doing the race. It's a fun course. Yeah, it was you know, beautiful. Yeah, was, pretty quick. Conditions were really nice. We kind of thought it was going to be a little bit colder, but once we got out there, it was incredible. Yeah, yeah, it was good. It's always good when you get the frosted beard, too. <laughs> Well, that's it for this week. 
Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you next week right here on Upper Michigan's very own Discovering.